Hi, everybody. This is Stephen Evans, Executive Director of PhotoFest. And um, I'd like to welcome you to our second Creative Conversations Digital. <clears throat> this is a new series that we started in the wake of the coronavirus COVID-19 health crisis. And it's we're using it to bring programming to you, programming from our recent PhotoFest Biennial 2020 um, and our central exhibition, which is African Cosmologies, Photography, Time and the Other, curated by Mark Seeley. <clears throat> so it's been our pleasure to work on this, to be able to continue to deliver programs um, that uh, were postponed during the time of the biennial. And we are very fortunate to have the support of many foundations, government and private supporters to help us in this work including the Houston Endowment, the Brown Foundation, the Texas Commission on the Arts, the National Endowment for the Arts, the Houston, uh, the City of Houston through the Houston Arts Alliance, excuse me, uh, the Philip and Edith Leonian Foundation, the Wortham Foundation, the Powell Foundation, the WWW Foundation, Nina and Michael Zilka, and uh, the PhotoFest Board of Directors. And there'll be a full list of the funders available at the end of the program. Today, uh, our Associate Curator and Director of Publications, Max Fields, will be talking with Ida Silvestri, whose um, work uh, was extremely well received in the biennial. Um, it's very uh, beautiful and delicate work that's dealing with um, some very harsh realities, I'll say. So there's a, a very interesting juxtaposition within the work that um, visitors really responded to. And when we're able to reopen the biennial, you'll be able to see these works in person if you're in Houston. And um, I really do recommend that um, whenever it is possible. Ida comes from Eritrea, um, a country um, on the Eastern, on the Horn of Africa, and um, that achieved independence from Italy in the 20th century, and then later again from Ethiopia. Um, but it's been under the same rule since the 1990s, and there have been no national elections there. And that's led to um, uh, a, a lot of refugees leaving the country, um, which is one of the subjects of uh, Ida's investigations through her artwork. And I think we're going to hear about that and um, many other um, very important issues that she's dealing with in her work as the talk goes on. And so I thank you again for joining us. And um, without further ado, oh, one more thing. I did mention this is the second in our Creative Conversations Digital. And we're currently working on plans to bring you more programs throughout May and June. So please stay tuned for that. And um, we are really looking forward to this. I'll turn it over to Max Fields now. Thank you, everybody. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Max Fields. Uh, I'm the Associate Curator and Director of Publications at PhotoFest and I wanna thank you all for joining us today uh, for this conversation um, with PhotoFest Biennial 2020 artist, Ida Silvestri, um, whose um, series, Even This Will Pass, is featured in the exhibition, African Cosmologies, Photography, Time, and the Other, curated by Mark Seeley. The series is a visual essay on the relationships between uh, Eritrean migrants who make the dangerous journey from their homeland to Europe in search of safety and a better life. Today, Ida will speak about this series and describe her motivations for producing images that blur the lines between documentary activism and aesthetic art interventions. She will also touch on her current work made during this period of isolation. Today, the artist will be speaking using audio only, her image withheld by request and out of necessity. This is a real world reminder that the effects of forced migration it's a real uh, of the effects of forced migration. And it's a reminder that the dangers that are perceived to be contained within national borders are often fluid and move with moving subjects. That is to say, politics and oppression are not geospecific and that the radius of systemic oppression is global. For those less familiar with Ida's work, I'll introduce her. Ida Silvestri is a UK based artist whose work explores human rights issues regarding migration, culture, ethnicity, identity, health, politics, and the urban landscape. 
She holds a bachelor's degree in photography from the University of Westminster in London. And Silvestri's career spans from documentary portraiture and commission work to workshops and talks on the issues within which her work is concerned. Um, her artistry explores unique approaches to photography. Through her practice, uh, she hopes to raise awareness and give voice to the voiceless and promote acceptance within communities. Silvestri has exhibited her work at venues including Autograph AVP, the Photographer's Gallery, Saatchi Gallery, Roman Road, and Mall Galleries, all in London, and abroad in France, Greece, Luxembourg, Taiwan, and Reunion Island. She was voted one of the British uh, in, voted one of British Journal of Photography's two best show winners at the Free Range Exhibition in 2013, and she was awarded the Festival Audience in 2017. Uh, uh, Photo Fest Audience 2017 Award. I'm sorry. Um, select publications um, include the British Journal of Photography, Auto Autograph Newspaper, Blow Photo, Looking for the Clouds, Contemporary Photography in Times of Conflict, Reframing Migration. Um, Lens Culture Photo Works, Photo Monitor, The Independent, and Time Out, among many others. And uh, I want to thank the artists for, for joining us today. And I want to thank you all again for joining us today. And um, Ida, if you want to join us, um, we can begin. Yes. Hi. Thank you for inviting me. And as everybody introduced me already, I would like to start by saying, why did I get into, into photography? So. Uh, being born in Eritrea during the Cold War with Ethiopia, I was exposed to war at early age. I wish that I could document what I was experiencing by blinking my eyes so not to be noticed. And I didn't do that for a while. Uh, sorry, it took me a while to realize that that's what I wanted to do. And this thought remained with me and provoked me to pursue photography in my adult age, I would say. And like Stephen and Max uh, said, I live in the UK now and um, my work involves, I would say I'm a documentary uh, photographer, but uh, some people may not agree <laughs> with it. And, uh, but uh, mainly my concern is migration, ethnicity, and uh, gender and health. And I work closely with communities, especially minority communities where I'm living right now. Is that okay, Max, or do I need to add more? <laughs> I think that's great. Um, you know, I think it's important for the audience to understand a little bit about you from the perspective of um, as if they have never um, interacted with your work. Could you talk a little bit about um, the steps that led you to uh, pursue photography um, and um, contemporary art making rather than pursuing, um, you know, some uh, these issues, uh, exploring these issues in another field? Uh, so like I mentioned, I, there was one incident during the war that kind of was stuck in my head. Uh, I was in a town, a smaller town visiting and that town was taken, uh, we're talking about during, uh, the war between Ethiopia and Eritrea, and the town was taken over by the guerrilla fighter, Eritrean guerrilla fighter at the time. And obviously, I experienced war. I ran, I was running away from bullets, missiles, and all those, as others uh, did. And there was one incident. They were chained prisoners. About I don't know, I was young. They seemed hundreds of them chained legs and hands and walking from one end of the, to, to the, uh, from the town to the other end for water because it's a hot place and everybody was looking for water. They were taking it to the water port, let's say a river. And they would do that journey every morning and evening. It's chained up prisoners and everybody had to stand still, not say a word until those people passed. And that kind of, that moment was stuck in my head for years. And I, I thought, uh, I was a child, and then I thought, I wish I could blink my eyes and take a picture of this, because I knew if I, took a, if I had a camera, I would have been in trouble. Not, not thinking that nowadays, uh, you know, the Google uh, glasses, obviously, you could take pictures with us, and not realizing that I could have done it if it was nowadays, or maybe, I don't know. But the idea remained with me, and, uh, 
photography, why photography? I, I must say I was attracted uh, by it. I, work, I, I read a lot of books um, in early years of photography and I followed Gordon Parks work quite closely and I liked the black and white imagery from the beginning and um, Dorothy Langs and yeah, so I was attracted by those contrasting colors and uh, I think I, I, that's the reason why I would say. Um, you touched on this a bit, and, and Stephen did as well in his introduction, but I think it's really important to provide a bit of context for the audience about the social and political histories that inform your series, uh, Even This Will Pass, the work that was featured in the PhotoFest Biennial Exhibition. Um, specifically, could you talk about the underlying issues in Eritrea that have led to the mass exodus of Eritrean citizens from their homeland to Europe? Um, and could you talk about the social, economic, and political conditions that have spurred this, mo uh, this, this movement? Yeah, sure. Uh, so for my final bachelor's uh, degree project, I wanted to focus on Eritrea due to the escalation allegation of abuse against the government. Uh, and while researching on this issue, I came across stories about Eritreans dying in attempt to flee the country. It's, uh, this was before the major European crisis took place. And it was at a time when death told in the Sahara Desert and Mediterranean Sea did not make the main stream media. And I was overwhelmed by my finding and wanted to raise awareness and shine the light. So this is the reason why I started this journey. Even though uh, my initial thoughts were political and as I do deeper into the subject, my approach became more focused on the humanitarian crisis of the journeys. And uh, therefore, that's when I, I decided to, uh, to put my energy towards the journey and let the audience ask why people are fleeing Eritrea. So uh, the Lampedusa boat tragedy that happened in October 2013, where about 368 African died. The majority of them were Eritreans. And I, I would say that was the wake up moment for Europe and put Eritrea in the limelight. So why are there lots of Eritrean migrating? And why is this small country in East Africa producing lots of uh, migrants? That's the question that surfaced. And I would say, if I talk about Eritrea, we're talking about Eritrea, I would say a guerrilla fighter who turned hero after liberating Eritrea from a cold war with Ethiopia. And it was, I was he was elected in 93 after a referendum and I was still there uh, then. And since then has turned to a dictator and has governed Eritrea for 27 years. So the regime, uh, this regime gives the country its nickname, the North Korea of Africa, <laughs> and keeps its uh, population under strong surveillance. So there's no freedom of speech or religion, and only few are allowed to leave the country uh, legally. If they are caught escaping Eritrea, they are automatically targeted as criminals and they punish and also their family members will be punished either through imprisonment or monetary fines. So uh, Eritrea, especially those aged between 18 to 46, 45, I would say, sometimes the, this guideline goes above uh, from 18 to 60, are forced to serve an indefinite period of uh, national service. So this is one of the main causes for the migration and they were, uh, the national service supposed to be for 18 months and then it became permanent. And he uses uh, those youngsters as uh, slaves, I would say, to build roads in a very, very harsh conditions. And sometimes uh, there, there are cases where inexperienced people were sent to the front line during 1997 border conflicts with Ethiopia again. So 
due to those restrictions and hard punishments, a lot of Eritreans uh, flee. And because there's no, uh, Eritrea is not a, it's known as no war, no war zone right now, it's quite difficult for Eritreans to claim asylum in Europe. I would say, does that, that, that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, and then, you know, if we're looking, so these, what I have on uh, the screen now is we're looking at images from the series. Um, these are the result of, of your investigations into this, uh, this, these sort, this sort of uh, politics. Um, and this is as it was presented at the Protofest Biennial um, and, is, and will be represented again, as Stephen mentioned. Yeah. Um, but I, I think it's, it's also one of the interesting things that I wanted to talk about was the sort of destination point. Um, it seems the, the most divergent aspect in um, the story of all of these journeys are the places where they land. Um, everyone has the the point of departure as the as a commonality, a shared common, um, you know, uh, point or point of origin, I should say. Um, yeah. And I'm I'm just curious to know about what the destinations, um, what the the primary destinations are for the Eritrean migrants to Europe, and and perhaps you could um, tell us a little bit about why those spaces and those countries specifically are um, are. I, I, it's 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 bizarre to say, but like popular destinations for um, refugees. Uh, so destinations. Just to say that to clarify, eighty percent of the uh, people that flee Eritrea, they are either in Sudan or Ethiopia, refugee camps. So only about twenty percent, or even less than that out of the people that flee Eritrea make it to the Mediterranean Sea. And the motivations, the reason for leaving mainly, the commonalities are political, uh, political reasons for fleeing the country, one of the main, main reasons. And that's go through all, most of them. They all share that commonality. So when we go through the, the text later on, I'll, I, I highlight uh, the area where it says why they left the country. And then, um, and why the destination? The destination is either to do with families, friends, or the language. Everybody watches American movies or English movies. Uh, Eritrea has a lot of theaters because Italian built the capital, especially, and we've got lots of cinemas. And so English is kind of, kind of embedded within the culture nowadays. And I would say it's mainly friends, families, and the language that attracts the destinations. And, yeah. yeah. Um, could you, do you, perhaps like we should give people a bit of an overview about what this project is um, before going into the specifics about it. Could you describe what the series, even this will pass and, and how these, this series contains those stories? Yes, so Even This Will Pass is uh, a project about Eritrean migrants leaving illegally from Eritrea in the, uh, in the journey to the UK. So I specifically chose the ones that landed in London. Obviously, not everybody stops uh, in London. They are, some of them, they go to other parts of Manchester or bigger towns. And the reason why I chose London, because I lived in London and my community was based in London. That's the reason why I chose and uh, I would say this series was triggered by my close friend's story. So unfortunately, the, those series are not rare and they're quite common. And uh, everybody has kind of done those kind of uh, journeys. And when I heard my friend's story, I was inspired to dig further and uh, ask friends of friends if they knew anybody who done those kind of journeys. And I came across so many, uh, lots of them. And most of them, they were fearful sharing their stories because of uh, consequences and punishments or persecutions from the government, not only to them or uh, 
they're thinking about their family back home. So initially I found about 25 people and I ended up interviewing only about 20 and then five dropped out and then I, I remained with the 15. And uh, it was really hard to get the stories out. And they were very, very scared. So I thought I'll take this fear and somehow I need to work with this fear to create this project. So initially I had a clear idea how I wanted to do the project. And I said, I'm gonna do a documentary photography. I'm gonna create, uh, I'm gonna take portraits and interview those people and I'm gonna record it. But then I came to learn that uh, this approach started taking its own organic progression. So I had to kind of follow, oh, follow it so one of them was they didn't want to show their faces so how do i take pictures uh, and do that and then there was a lot of emotion involved and how do i uh, show those emotions and then i had the journey line so there was so many elements to work with and and um, so i said to myself okay i'm going to take portraits but those portraits should look like mag shots or passport pictures so the mag shots, because if they went back to Eritrea, the government will take pictures of them straight away and put them to jail. So I thought that could work. And then passport, those people, most of them, they made it to UK without any identification because of the smugglers. And that's the way it came out about to do the portraits this way. So if you imagine this portrait were not blared, and uh, no, uh, typical, they would look like, or if they were in color, they would look like possible pictures or uh, the prison max shot without the profile, obviously. So that's the initial idea. And then I thought, how can I preserve the emotions and the fears and all the experiences that I went through? And, I, uh, and then what I did was I invited them to meet me in a cafe or in a space where it was quiet with the pale kind of background and I would ask them to sit behind the wall, uh, sorry, in front of the wall. And we go through this very, very intense interview. And after the intense interview, I'll take one shot, a blurred image. The reason why I did this, I wanted to preserve those image, uh, emotions because I thought to preserve emotions uh, with a focused image is challenging enough. How can I preserve those images unfocused? If I take the images with the straight after interview, somehow I feel like I have preserved those images, but then how am I gonna convey that towards uh, the audience? How can I convey those? This is when I guess the text came in place and the journey lines came in place. So I think am I going a bit too ahead or I don't know, tell me. <laughs> no, I think I think that's the, the only question that, that's coming to mind is essentially like, how did you find the subjects that you were interviewing? Was this, um, were these people that you were familiar with or did it take, um, did it take some time to get to um, to meet and to get to know uh, the people um, who you were interviewing and photographing? Um, you said, you know, five people dropped out. It was very difficult to get stories out of um, the the people that you were talking to for this series. And um, so I'm, I'm guessing that um, you either knew some of the interviews before or interviewees and uh, subjects before, um, or you had to speak with them over a period of time. Could you talk about that process? Yes. Yeah, so uh, the first one was a friend of mine who kind of inspired this project. And then a uh, friend of friends, unfortunately, these stories are not rare. And most of Eritreans have taken this similar journey. So if you ask one, you said, actually, I know this person who has gone through the same kind of journeys. So that's the way it came about. Mm. Yeah. And then maybe, maybe we can um, return to a question about the aesthetic decisions you made to create the series, you know, um, when you're talking about the blur um it really inspires me to think about think deeply about the sort of aesthetic decisions that you made especially when considering 
um, the relationship to the series with documentary um, as a presentation of fact, something um, that is complicated by, as you said, um, the blur, the something withheld. Um, so, you know, sp spectacle in this work is withheld in almost every sense of, of the word. The images are rendered in black and white. The sitter's face and body are blurred uh, to the point of unrecognizability. The threaded line that traces the subject's journey is made material only by a, a thin colored line piercing through the image's surface. So could you, could you talk about your decision to utilize photography as the medium through which to illustrate this story um, and what you were thinking about in relation to photography's essential function to make visible an always already fleeting moment. Um, I mean, you've touched on it a bit, but yeah. with the with the blur, but I, it's maybe you can expand on the relationship between visibility and optics in your work. Yeah. So when Mark Seeley <laughs> first saw the series, he pulled out a book from a shelf and said, have you read this? <laughs> and my answer was no. I think your work falls into this category, he goes. Aesthetic journalism, how to inform without informing. Do you know the book by Alfredo Ramerotti? And uh, I thought, oh my goodness, without realizing I've created uh, a project that could fit in this uh, category. But unfortunately, I didn't have any theoretical influences when I created uh, even this whole pass. And I just had an ambition to highlight issues and didn't make headlines in the mainstream me media at the time. So there were a lot of, like I was mentioning, there were a lot of challenges when I created this uh, project. And I quickly realized I had to change the way I work normally. And one of them was, how do I approach it? And the main thing that I wanted to do was approach it conceptually. And I did not want to show any imagery, gross or pitiful imagery a type of uh, similar to the reportage uh, kind of image that it shows the crisis. So a lot of migration, thank you for that image. So this type of imagery, I thought I need to stay away from that right. because uh, those people, when I, did I grant uh, permission to take those pictures this way and all that? And I wanted to preserve the dignity as well as the anonymity because most of the sitters did not want to show their faces due to consequences and the fear of these consequences, not only for themselves, but even for their uh, family members. So like I mentioned earlier, the fear became the factor in interpreting this uh, project. And I wanted to illustrate this fear and I devised only one shot and blurred, uh, I created blurred images in order to preserve their anonymity and their, sorry, I, I kind of, I'm lost with words. Uh, I wanted to preserve <laughs> the anonymity and dignity in this sense. So looking at those kids now, I feel really sorry. I don't want to really look at it. I don't want to engage with this kind of imagery. And I was trying to avoid that. I didn't want people to stay away. I want people to be asking questions and I want people to kind of discover by looking at those blurred images, why those blurred images are blurred and why there's a line across and why there's a text next to it. And I want the audience to interact with the uh, project and find these little elements of surprise and come up to the, you know, they need to connect some dots in order to kind of understand what's happening. So uh, like I mentioned earlier, for the blurred images, I was looking at passport or either passport or mug shots. And the reason I said mug shots, because if those people went back to Eritrea, they will be classified as terrorists and they will be in jail straight away. And then the idea of not having documentation or identification and make all those journeys to come here all the way. And that kind of sits well with the uh, uh, passport idea of portraiture. And the visibility, you were talking about, can you just repeat that side? Uh, that's the, the end part of the question, please. Yeah, sure. I mean, um, 
the question is, what were you thinking about in relation to photography's essential function to make the make visible an always fleeting moment, and um, specifically referring to your interest um, in visibility and optics? Um, and one thing that one thing that I've read recently, uh, Isle Weitzman was writing about the use of blur and um, by the photography uh, or by the photographer, um, whether it's um, by circumstance or on purpose to show the photographer's position. But in this case, um, that that statement is almost like is completely reversed. The blur is utilized for the subject's position, not yes, um, not to enhance the factual nature of the image. Definitely. So I didn't have any control over it. My control was, OK, I'll take my shot instead of full uh, body. And uh, the subject has decided how they want to be portrayed in a sense. And I had to go along uh, with that. So there was not much thinking around it yeah. really, uh, because it was quick and had to be done. And uh, the only way I could show is Blair. So I'm thinking I want to have some element of identification in a sense. If you look back, you know, you can tell that a portrait. That's my optic. I think that's the visual that I was requiring from my, from my end. I wanted to make sure that people can identify as that a portrait. Yeah. Apart from that, and the blareness uh, is in, in one sense works because it feels like it's a ghost in the background and we got these lines coming to us and, and in a sense they are. Yeah. Yeah. And, and could you talk about your choice uh, to utilize thread to illustrate the migratory path of the subjects that you're speaking with? For me, it's it's such an apt metaphor. Um, one thinks of the thin line of a border on a map, which exists um, as a as a rendering. Um, in person, though, these thin lines, uh, the immaterial borders, exist material uh, materially as uh, spatial barricades designed as checkpoints, barriers, and fences spaces uh, made to withhold populations from movement. So what were you thinking about the use of this uh, th thin colored line um, to, signify, to signify the movement, the journey? Yeah, so uh, when I was talking, uh, obviously during the interviews, those intense interviews, uh, destination came. Like they were, everyone was talking about, I started here, I went there, I spent a lot of, uh, so many months here, and then I went there, and then from here I moved on. So they're like tracking stories, definitely. So I thought, what, how can I do this? Initially, they were put digitally. They were add, added digitally. And then, but after much consideration, the trade played a major uh, role in the development of the project. So I had to think otherwise. And I was looking at the <laughs> London underground for the inspiration, believe it or not. Mm. So I asked, uh, and then I was saying, okay, so this was your journey line. So can you please choose a color? Why would you, and then think about a color, what meant to you? And they would say yellow. So, and I go and say, why yellow? And what kind of yellow? Is it cir uh, uh, circle line yellow? So we'll go to underground. I used the movement on the underground, uh, the colors from the underground and to kind of identify, expect, especially what colors it would, uh, they, uh, they want it to be. So it's precise yellow and whatever. So that's the way it started off. And then I would say the portrait could stand alone without the trait and the text, but they didn't capture the full uh, significance of the emotion experienced by the subject. So I thought I need to add this to intensify the experiences and to show the stop and the start and going further on the journeys. All those journey lines did that. They reinforced the experiences, I would say. That's the reason why I created. And then uh, the act of uh, threading and stitching for me, it's like creating, you know, when somebody has a scar and you get those stitches and the doctors and the pain that uh, people go through. And with my kind of stitching, I was recalling those pains, those stories and experiences that I, 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 uh, I ex uh, interviewed. And I think for me, the thread plays a big role. That becomes the identity and because this identity is usually suppressed, uh, they re really don't want to talk about their journey. They put it behind their head. And it's, it took a while for some, for some people to share what went on. 
So if I'm not showing the face and I'm not conveying any emotions through an image, how can I do that? So for me, I feel like the threat kind of intensify, reinforce the experiences that those people had. Yeah. And also the other, the other component, very important component to the work is uh, the, the text that's presented alongside um, the, uh, the, the image. Um, I know yeah. you wanted to focus on this text. Um, perhaps you could tell us a little bit about this person. So Angusom uh, is one of the youngsters that I've interviewed. Actually his story, his experiences were documented in an Italian newspaper at the time. And what I do, uh, so let me, I'll just go back slightly. When I did the interviews, some of the interviews, oh my goodness. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. Oh my goodness. I can't turn it off. Sorry, I can't turn it off. That's okay. Oh my God. <laughs> I'm so sorry about that. Oh goodness. It's not loud. It's not interrupting. It's you're you're ready to go. Okay. So sorry, my computer went funny. And okay. So can you take me back where I was? Sorry. Yeah, we're just we're just talking about Engelson's story from uh, and and his recognition in Italian newspapers. Yes. Uh, so Angeson's story was quite, um, I, I, I'll say one of my uh, favorites in the sense that it shows how dramatic the stories can be and, and how difficult those uh, journeys are. Mm -hmm. And it, it talks about, sorry, I'm just trying to get my screen back into normal. Sorry about that. Bear with me, please, guys. Sorry about this. No I make sure. Yeah, sorry about that. Full screen. Okay. And it talks about uh, most of the experiences that Eritrean feel in a very condensed form. So like I was saying earlier, those people are, the interviews were quite long and some of them were 30 minutes and some of them they were 40 minutes. And trying to transcribe the interviews was a process of, uh, my goodness, <laughs> I spent several nights crying uh, and trying to condense this, uh, these stories. How can I do that? So was, there was a lot of back and forth with the uh, sitters and trying to come up to a conclusion or a summary that could highlight what they went through and could really tell the story in a way that they're trying to tell me. So it was really difficult to do that. And uh, Max, do you mind reading the stories and then I'll carry on a little bit further? Sure. Do you mind? Um, I am witnessing lots of atrocities and maltreatment. I'm running, running with uncomfortable clothing. Now I am walking, walking in the middle of the night in a damp terrain. Now I am on a camel. I am not alone. We run out of food and water. Now I am drinking green and smelly water. I hear that the people who help me get here are detained in consequence. My mother is detained. I'm hearing bad stories. The sea in winter is very bad. I am told I have 50, 50 chance, I, I have a 50-50 chance of survival. I'm in a small boat with many other people and a pregnant lady. Suddenly I feel like I am taking part in an action movie. The waves are very scary, big and four times higher than the boat. They are crashing into the boat. Waves are lifting the boat up high and dropping it right back down. I am soaked. We are soaked with salty water. Everything is soaked. Food and water contaminated. People are vomiting. The pregnant lady screaming from labor pain. Because of the waves, the boat crashes into a big Mongolian ship that was in the international waters. The boat splits. We are trying to hold it together with the anchor. The engine that was pumping the water out of the boat breaks. I don't want to drown. We cannot drown. We are constantly removing the water manually from the boat, removing water for the duration of the journey. The baby is coming. The baby is born. We are looking for something clean and sterile to cut and tie the cord with. Cord tight. 
Yeah. We were 71 at the start of the journey. We finished 72. So as you can see, uh, those interviews, uh, I, those I created an amalgamation of experiences and the key moments of the participants' journey from Eritrea to London. And then the sequence of the layout kind of suggests the severity of the story and, and guides the audience to go through an intense kind of experience. And then if you can see, it kind of ends on a positive note. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so some of them say, I'm free now, I'm here now, I got to the destination that I wanted. And, and then if you look at the top, the first uh, sentence is usually what happened to them in Eritrea. So most of the poems in the first sentence is what happens uh, to them in Eritrea. And then, like I said, I try to kind of end in a positive note, but that positive note is not really positive because once they hear and they go through a lot of mental health kind of problems, especially with the male. And there's a lot of suicidal uh, uh, thoughts and some have committed suicide, not my, from my series, but some are trying to understand. There's a lot, a lot of trauma that's not dealt with and all those issues are not kind of addressed. And uh, so the stories are quite unique, but most are dreadful. And I think sometimes they're worse than what they would expect face in Eritrea, I think. And, but this unknown danger doesn't uh, deter Eritreans from leaving. And they believe that any situation in Eritrea is worse than any danger they could encounter during the exodus, especially with Angusom. He knew that he had 50-50 chance, but he still took those kind of journeys. Right. And, and uh, so there's different type, I guess they're unique, but they all have different kind of experiences. So some of them, they are the lucky ones board an airplane to exile. So initially, if you look at my series, there's uh, the one with the pink winter, she kind of took an airplane and went to exile. So this is early stages. She's not here, but and others, few make it to the uh, final destination, but after months and months of struggle. And some end up in the uh, Sahara Desert, and sorry, some die in the Sahara Desert and others in the Mediterranean Sea. And most are in refugee camps or imprisoned. And, uh, and some of them, they kidnapped and trafficked. And sometimes the kidnappers target the people in refugee camps in Sudan and Ethiopia because they knew those people have members abroad that could pay the ransom money. So there's a lot of business happening, uh, trafficking that's going on. And uh, so for me, I guess uh, the communalities on the journeys are mainly political reason and uh, the kidnapping and the tortures and the smugglers, everybody has to pay money and the monetary issues that everybody has and the length of the journeys, those, I would say those are the kind of communalities. Right. And for the audience, the image that is up on the screen now is, yeah. is, is a representation of all of the journeys superimposed on top of one another with the various thread colors um, represented in space. And um, this is a close up of the map. This is not with the threads on it, but you could just see the incredible amount of territory um, that is that is represented in these journeys, and then here you can just see the incredible divergence of, of um, paths that these people are taking, um, you know, and through this various sort of terrain um, and methods that people are taking to get um, home. And Ida, I think for the sake of time, we might move forward to talk about a little bit about what you're working on now, um, because I think it's interesting and it, it absolutely relates to the work that was presented in the biennial and then we can open up for the Q&A. And if anyone from the audience has um, questions for Ida relating the series, um, please do um, put your comments in the chat and um, in the Q&A section and, and um, at the conclusion of Ida's presentation, we'll um, pick up there. Yeah, so I'm working with an initiative called uh, Art Refuge. They're doing something called Corona Quilt. Apparently there's a quilt pattern called Corona. And they're doing some initiative already and they're engaging uh, 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 communities through that. And they asked me if I could do something towards it. How can I collaborate? They wanted to collaborate with me. It's a group that goes to Calais normally and does art therapy uh, with migrants in uh, Calais. 
and I was supposed to go with them and then didn't happen because of obviously our lockdowns. And so I devised this Corona quilt silhouette where I'm targeting vulnerable people from different, different backgrounds and asking to engage with this work. So they can send me silhouette images, sorry, uh, profile images, and then I'll convert them to silhouettes. And I'm asking people to send me either a short text or just a word or a poem that kind of describes their mental state, the current mental state during Corona. And uh, the other work, <laughs> I called it the, the Great Gold Rush of 2020. And it's because of the toilet paper shortages and all the, I didn't, I, I didn't know there was a shortage of condoms, <laughs> but, uh, I, but I, I'm kind of looking at those, uh, the ideas that I have, and usually I'm kind of scared to implement those ideas, but th I, I thought I'm just going to go for it right now. And this is the way I'm feeling and I'm just throwing work as it comes, I would say. Yeah, I think it's really interesting that you're working on these two projects during the period of isolation, um, you know, during this pandemic. It's, I think a lot of people, it's great that we have such a nice audience today. Um, it, it says something about the way that we um, all are experiencing time and also the ways in which we're all looking for um, creative output and expression. Um, and, you know, I do think the the great gold rush of 2020, I think what's what's nice about it is that it is funny. And um, it's funny. Definitely. It brings it brings some levity. But I, I do think that the, into the situation, but also like much of your work, it's uh, relates directly to um, the sort of rhetoric around um, uh, social, cultural and class um, inequality as it pertains uh, the people who were um, people who were and are like hoarding these materials or seeking out these materials are doing so um, mainly because um, because they've been conditioned to, to, to fend for themselves much in the same way that the you know migrants who are leaving Eritrea are fending for themselves um, you yeah. know unable to sort of seek um, refuge within their own um, their own sort of countries. Um, uh, yeah. government. Um, so perhaps uh, let, we can open, uh, this is a good time to open up to questions. Um, I know that Stephen wants, has a, has a question or two for you. Stephen, if you want to join um, the video. That was fascinating. Um, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi. Um, I, Ida, thank you. I mean, it was really, really wonderful to learn so many details about how you made the work. And um, <clears throat> it's, uh, as I said in the beginning, in the introduction, there's a, there's a, a great tension between the beauty of the work and the delicacy of the thread over the blurred image. And then when you read the text um, to experience um, how, uh, how harrowing the journeys were um and, and in the first person from the from the from the sitter of for your portraits um when i was working on editing the book we had to choose um s some of the images so i um read very closely all of the journeys and i have to admit to you that it um going through your series at that time moved me to tears so i was i, I think it's very powerful I did want to ask you about the text. They are uh, rendered as poems, and are you? Do you consider them uh, poems that you've created, or that are in collaboration with the sitter, the subject of the of the image and the story, or how do you think about that text? Uh, I would say definitely in collaboration because the text was very long and I chose those lines in order to make sense. So I pulled the lines straight out of the text. So I didn't reorder, I, I reordered slightly, but I did not rewrite anything. So if you can see some of the language, I kept the same. And most interviews were in Eritrean language and 
just few in English. So I kind of trans, uh, tr transcribed everything and I pulled out some lines to make sense of the story. And I went back and forth to see if the story was accurate. So it's a collaboration more than anything, I would say. And for me, the text is as important as the image. I don't think I would ever show those series without the, the, uh, the text. Thank you, thank you. And then I just wanted to, oops, sorry. I wanted to make a uh, comment about the new work. Um, and I'm sure you're aware, but I don't know if the audience is aware that um, Eritrea quite, um, it, it became international news that they refused a shipment of aid supplies that was um, coming from China and Ethiopia, that they didn't allow it to come into the country. So um, there's quite a lot of concern about the handling of coronavirus there. Um, yeah. in Eritrea. Um, do you have updates on what the situation is there? So from what I, I know, I've got some uh, uh, yeah, family members still there. From what I know is uh, uh, people are more scared of the government than the corona. So uh, they will do whatever the government says. And we heard that there was uh, one or two cases where uh, put in quarantine straight away and uh, so nothing accurate comes out of Eritrea. So it's, 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 it's difficult and people are scared mm -hmm. to talk and whatever you hear in the media may not be 100% accurate. Who's, who's saying those things? And so it's quite a difficult situation. Uh, it was interesting to read between the lines of the um, officials uh, that were Eritrean or officials that were part of um, the WHO or other relief agencies, because you could tell reading between the lines that they were being extremely careful in how yes. they were talking about the situation. So yeah, yeah I think it, it, it illustrates uh, some of the issues there. Yeah, yeah, um, well, definitely. Max, do we have some other questions? We don't have any questions right now. If anybody has a question, um, please do send them uh, along. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll leave some space. Um, for you to ask another question. Um, and while y'all are coming up with a question, maybe I'll ask one more, um, which is actually a question that Mark Seeley asks. And it's, you know, what is the work the work is doing? And I guess the question to me is um, in relation to your work is, is really about what, what effect do you want from people who see this work? Um, what, what sort of inspiration um, or motivation do you want them to, to get from this? Uh, so first of all, I created it because I wanted to raise awareness and I wanted to show that this is happening. And my frustration initially was because uh, the Western media was not highlighting it and the death toll maybe were not big enough for them, but for me, they were huge. And why are they not doing this? And that's the main motivation to highlight. And another one I would say to... Uh, for the Eritreans even to think about it properly before you take those journeys because they are very harrowing and they're very challenging. I think kids as young as seven years old or t uh, like, you know, 10, 12 are fleeing Eritrea. And there's, a, there's so many in the, in the camps and I just wanted to know what's happening and they need to know what they're gonna be facing and all that. And then uh, I would say, Ultimately, I think if we can create this type of work that's going to raise awareness, highlight difficult issues, give voice to voiceless people, I think for me, this, this is my, uh, I would say I'm an activist <laughs> in that sense. Uh, and I always strive to do kind of work with this kind of issues or highlight difficult uh, things. Brilliant. Well, I think um, that's gonna conclude our event. Um, Haida, I really want to thank you so much for taking your time out to speak with us today, um, all the way from Kent in the UK. And, um, and you know, I also want to thank the audience so much for um, taking time out, um, you know, from your, from your uh, moment of isolation um, to spend time with PhotoFest, it means a lot. And for those who are seeking to, um, to engage in more, um, uh, of PhotoFest projects, please do visit uh, the PhotoFest website 
um, where we'll be posting more events throughout the spring and summer that are related both to um, our African Cosmologies exhibition and the 10 by 10 exhibition that is now on, um, on hold. Um, www.photofest.org. <laughs> <laughs> I'm chiming in. Um, yeah, um, I'll just say that, uh, thank you, Ida. That was really, uh, really enlightening. And um, Max, thank you for your interrogations and um, uh, thoughtfulness. I think that um, uh, you've put together a very strong program that, that I mentioned will be unveiling in uh, May and June and also some other programs that at the end of April. Uh, so I encourage everyone to subscribe for the PhotoFest emails um, at www.fotofest.org or to the YouTube channel, which uh, seems to be working very well. Mm -hmm. And um, um, thank you everybody for, for listening and looking. And uh, we hope that everyone is safe and healthy. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs> oh, Max, did you want to talk about the next talk? Yes. So you have a slide for it. I do, and I spelled Richard's name wrong. I'm so uh, <laughs> so sorry, Richard. I've, I've got you as Richard Ard. Um, but the next talk will be held on April 29th at 6 p.m. Um, and it's be a create. It'll be a creative conversation between one of the artists featured in the 10 by 10 exhibition, um, Richard Frischman, who will be in conversation with a Houston-based writer and critic, uh, Gary Reese. It'll be live on Zoom and YouTube Live. And if you're listening to this now, um, you know to register, you'll have to visit for the uh, Zoom uh, talk, you'll visit um, Eventbrite for your free ticket, or you can watch free on PhotoFest's YouTube Live channel. It'll be an interesting project and we hope to see you all there. Thank you all again. Thanks. Thanks everybody. Thanks, everybody. Bye.